Listen to the language of the last three and a half years. Lockdowns, travel restrictions, stay-at-home orders. This rhetoric, written by government agencies and corporate media, speaks to a clear intention, a concerted effort to keep us in place. Fortunately for us, a real grassroots movement, powered by real men and women, can never be stopped. Because mankind will always find the way forward. And this is where it all starts. With the WayForward's new membership platform, you can connect with like-minded community and like-minded businesses near you by simply typing in your zip or postal code and setting a radius. We also have a marketplace featuring the best holistic health brands and products with deals you won't find anywhere else. And the best part is you pay whatever you want to be a part of it. The Way Forward starts with a growing community coming together to share ideas, form local groups, and conduct business with like-minded men and women. Because if we're constantly being told what to do by so-called authorities, it's easy to feel helpless. But it's essential to know that we're not. Each of us has the power, and that power amplifies when we come together. There are many more health-conscious and sovereign-minded men and women than we realize. And this is where we all meet. Visit thewayforward.com to join virtually, connect locally, and pay whatever you want to be a part of it. This is The Way Forward. Thank you for being my second in-person podcast. Um, Thanks so much for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, your session during the end of COVID was actually, I think, our one of our top five most watched sessions, which says a lot because we had 120,000 people tune into it, you know. Um, and we ended up, I don't know if you saw that, using that as an actual podcast episode on the way forward to as a standalone because oh, okay. it was just awesome. So it's good to have you back. But um yeah, your article that you wrote on the the situation, I think it was called Induction by Confusion, the sequel on Israel Palestine was incredible. And like this conversation, I'm not gonna try to just mimic that entire article, but it's hard not to because you touch on so many things that I think are so important with what's going on in the world right now. But I think the most appropriate place to start is just you giving a background of your story. Cause I actually don't know your full story. Yeah. Just how you got to do what you're doing right now. I came from a family where the legacy of abuse was passed down generation mm -hmm. after generation. And so I grew up in that environment and it took me a long time to figure out what was going on. I was definitely in my thirties by the time I really started healing myself. I got into all this holistic healing stuff and I was working on healing myself, but I never, really found the key which was the abuse the psychological abuse because it's so hard to see the sexual abuse i had already faced because that was a lot more obvious but the psychological abuse is so hard to see it's invisible it's not like you have like a black and blue mark on your body you can show somebody and be like something's wrong so i didn't know it was wrong <clears throat> it took me a long time to figure this out but by the time i did all of a sudden my whole life made sense like when i discovered that term narcissistic abuse yeah. i understood basically my whole life until that point. And so then I started working to heal on that. And then I started helping people heal from narcissistic abuse by applying my holistic background along with what I learned about narcissistic abuse. And then of course, 2020 came and it became really obvious that the same thing that happens in abusive relationships and family systems and workplaces and any small social system is happening on a societal level. Mm -hmm. And it's the same patterns of abuse. So I started speaking about this. There's a lot of people who were holistically minded, who were, seemed to understand narcissistic abuse dynamics that then fell for 2020. So how, what made you unique to not fall for it? I'm not sure if they all fell for it or if some of them might see it mm -hmm. and they didn't have the courage to stand up and speak because that's the hardest part. Mm. Um, okay, then what gave you the courage to do that? 
I just knew I had to. Mm. Like there was, it got to the point where like the fear was growing so big. And then all of a sudden I realized that the fear of not doing it, of not speaking when I had the chance and just looking at, you know, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, how am I going to feel about myself if I didn't start speaking up now? Mm. And so that just became bigger than the fear of speaking up because I knew exactly what would happen if I spoke up because the same thing happened in my family system yeah. when I did. So I already knew that was going to happen, which is part of that fear that was stopping me. But then uh, one day on Instagram, you know, I was making little hints about it, but not like really directly talking. And one girl commented and she said, you know, I'm so disappointed that all these people in narcissistic abuse, all these experts, you know, who taught me not to be silent, who taught me not to just comply and go along with it. They're all silent now. Where are you? Where is everybody else? Yeah. And I said, you're right. And that like gave me this impetus, like this energy to like start speaking. Yeah. Somebody called me out. What are, what are the common patterns we see with narcissistic abuse dynamics and narcissistically abusive families and those that we saw over the last three and a half years. Yeah. It's interesting that the, the tactics are the same on the micro to the macro level. Sometimes people will say, it seems like they all read the same book. How can they possibly all do the same things? And that really bothered me for a long time until I realized it's actually the spiritual warfare at the core they're all serving Did you grow the up same... a spiritual person? No. Not at all. Okay. I mean, we grew up Catholic, but then I woke up to all the abuse that was happening in the church, yeah. you know, and all of that. But it's, it's the same tactics, and it's why they didn't have to study this, because yeah. it's this innate spiritual warfare. They're all serving the same master, and so they all know how to do the same things. So, like, the deception, like, the disturbing the communications, that's the first thing they have to do, because if they can disturb communications between you and your loved ones— then you can't talk about reality. And we need to be able to verify reality together. Like our language constructs is part of what holds together our reality. Mm -hmm. So when we can't talk and then we start to grow suspicions of one another or we start to hear rumors and lies and smear campaigns about one another, they call that triangulation, but really it's a divide and conquer tactic. And so in any little social system, whether a family or a friend group or society at large, these are the tactics that have to happen to drive people apart and then everyone's loyalty is to the abusers or the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. So that's what we saw really intensely this whole time since 2020. And that, that would be called Stockholm syndrome, right? Is kind of what you're referring to there. So the, the Stockholm syndrome or what they call trauma bonding when you're in a relationship with someone, they say Stockholm syndrome is what happens like with strangers in a captivity situation. But really what happens in the brain and nervous system is the same thing as in an abusive relationship or like what happened in the world. There's four parameters that create this survival mechanism basically in our human nervous system. So the first one is isolation and that's physical and or psychological, which has to do with that information control, you know, controlling the information, the communication, because when you're isolated, you can't verify reality mm -hmm. with somebody else. You're afraid to talk about it. You're ashamed to talk about it or you just can't, you're so shut down. So then the second one is um, the, the perceived acts of kindness. So we call love bombing or idealization. It's not real kindness. It's a manipulation tactic where you start to trust this person. It starts to feel good when they tell you good things or they do nice things for you. And it's an intermittent reinforcement, which is part of the abuse cycle. That's what keeps people there working harder, investing more, developing an almost obsession with compliance to get that intermittent yeah. reward. And that's really the glue of any, of any abusive relationship at the very beginning. It's that back and forth. And then the next one is the perceived life threat where you either feel the perpetrator is going to kill you or something is going to kill you. You're afraid in some way. So they terrorize you in, in whatever way they can, which we saw with the virus since 2020. And then the fourth one is you get to this point where you feel like you can't escape. Mm -hmm. It's a perceived inability to escape. And so you develop learned helplessness because you feel like you have no control over your life, that you're completely stuck in the situation, which is why abuse victims will leave the house multiple times a day. They'll go to work. They'll take the kids out. They'll go to the grocery store and do life. But they keep coming home because something deep inside them believes that they can't leave. So it's an inner state of captivity even if we're not in physical confinement. 
Yeah. And with, with COVID, obviously there's a ton of parallels there, but you kind of, in this new article that you did, <clears throat> why I loved it so much is you take a lot of the same things that you said about COVID, which I think by now, especially on my podcast are like blatantly obvious to everyone and apply it to what's going on right now with a continuation of the narrative. And one of the things that you talk about is confusion followed by censorship. It's like they put out a lot of information, a lot of conflicting information. What I think back to is at the very beginning of COVID, there were mainstream sources talking about gain of function as if it was a real thing. And then they stopped doing that. And then they would insert some other things. And you'd hear some stuff from Andy Kaufman. You hear some stuff from other people. And then they just did blanket censorship on all of it to where we were in a total state of confusion. What do you see coming or maybe even starting to happen now with this whole situation uh, relating to what could be a global war? Yeah, so they're doing that same thing where they're letting all this information out and it's confusing messages and mixed messages and, you know, everybody has to wear a mask. No, nobody should be wearing masks. Oh, masks don't work. Now you need to wear two. So there's all this back and forth. What we're watching with the war is the same thing. It's very hard to know exactly what's happening, how much of what we're watching is propaganda. It's all over the place. Even people are flip-flopping, you know, that we're hearing in the media or in politics and everything. So what happens is, they put like all this information out and it's very confusing with all these mixed messages and things that don't make sense. And you're trying to decipher reality. And then all of a sudden they close it down and they're like, this is the reality. And for a lot of people, that's really relieving because that confusion is so stressful and so intense. And they're so overwhelmed with all this information and the responsibility to have to sift through it and discern what's true and what's not. It's so overwhelming and stressful that people can cling to that propaganda, whatever that whatever thing is. Whatever the accepted narrative exactly. ends up becoming. Wow, I've never thought of it like that. And what's so confusing about this situation in particular is that there's like, not only is this getting at people's identities in a very particular way, whereas the other one was just health-related decisions, which is a part of people's identity and somewhat political decisions, but now it's like, touching on religion, it's touching on culture, it's touching on race, it's touching on ethnicity. But <clears throat> deeper than that, it's like even the so-called freedom movement is split into into two, sometimes three camps when it comes to this situation too. So it's like, I don't know how, how do you see this playing out from a macro perspective amongst people who saw through the COVID narrative? From a macro meaning? Like just in general amongst <laughs> people who could see through the COVID narrative, how do you see this playing out? So it's been surprising, I'm sure you're seeing that too, that some people were so awake to what was happening in COVID are all of a sudden now just like cheering on genocide and war mm -hmm. and destruction and collective punishment of all these people and not thinking about where is this going? What are the implications of this? And that's how we can become enablers mm. of the abusive system. And I think that's, you know, again, it's that spiritual warfare on a, like a macro, macro scale. That's really what's going on. That's what war is. That's what all of these tactics that they're using are, where they're getting us to betray ourselves. They're getting us to betray our values. If we're not clear about that, if we don't really take a stand if we let ourselves be guided and we let ourselves just go with whatever flow whatever we're told we can become enablers of that without even realizing i think probably a lot of the people who are cheering this on don't even realize what they're cheering on mm -hmm. it's it's the the thing that is so crazy to watch for me and you see it happening on on both sides there's one side of the spectrum within the freedom movement, let's say, or people who saw through the COVID narrative, I don't even like referring it to a freedom movement, where they're cheering for what can only be called genocide of an entire group of people. And then the pendulum swings back the other way where you see a demonization of literally all Jewish people on the flip side of things. And it's like, you talk about in your article, the ability to hold nuance and the three different, like, I guess, ways to operate amidst chaos. And that's the wounded child, the adaptive child, and the functional adult. And 
it seems that many people who I had thought were functional adults are now reverting back to childlike ways. Can you touch on the difference between those three? Yeah, so the interesting thing too is like we might be more in the functional adult in certain areas of our life mm-hmm. and then there's certain topics or certain areas of our life right. where we're more triggered into these earlier stages. So the wounded child stage, it can often be like a nonverbal memory really of that wound that happened before we really talked about things or even had the words to explain what happened to us. That's the part we don't usually see. I learned this from Terry, Terry Rio. He's a therapist. He talks about this. But he said, what you don't see is the wound. What you see is the adaptation. And the adaptation is that teenage self, the older child, the adaptive child. That's where we learn how to survive whatever intensity, chaos, stress, trauma of our childhood. So fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, and somehow some sort of of behavior that we learn to cope with and survive that environment, that tends to be our go-to when that's triggered. Yeah. With the adaptive child versus the wounded child, can you touch on like the distinct differences between those two? So the wounded child is going to be extremely helpless Mm. because when you're a child and crazy things are happening around you, you're completely dependent on your caretakers, on the adults that are around you. So you feel completely powerless over the situation. So if you've ever noticed that you're like completely shut down and you just feel like there's nothing you can do. You can't even get words out. Like you're so frozen. That's probably the wounded child. The adaptive child is the one who's usually more of a, a rebel in some sort of way. Usually they're more fighting against something or they're running away from something. Um, so in our interpersonal relationships, that's really where the problems in our interpersonal relationships come up. It's when our adaptive children are arguing or getting into some kind of conflict and we're not realizing that we're actually responding to the past superimposed on the present there may be an element of the present that reminds us of the past but our nervous system is triggered into that state of the past that unresolved trauma so the wounded child would be like someone who right now is seeing the state of the world and saying like i can't even i'm too frozen i can't even look at any of it this is all too overwhelming to me Whereas the adaptive child might be someone who feels emboldened to take a strong stance and resist something or oppose something or fight for something with respect to like, let's say those are the type of people who might be attending a lot of rallies. And this is a very general statement. This is, I don't think there's anything wrong in principle attending a rally that is anti-genocide, right? But who is so strongly opposed to what's going on in a, in a rebellious way that they are then demonizing anyone who slightly supports Israel or vice versa. Would that be like what we would see with an adaptive yeah, child? Yeah, because sometimes the adaptive child will identify with the perpetrator because that's the point that feels like power. So let's say there's two parents and there's a perpetrator and then there's a victim. Mm-hmm. And it's not always so clear. Sometimes it goes back and forth. But the child might the adaptive child might identify with the perpetrator and then behave like the perpetrator, Got it. And, dehumanizing people. And we see that happening with both sides of the mm-hmm. situation too. I would say also the wounded child could be the activation of you don't even see what's going on. You're not even capable of forming the words to say, I can't look at that. I don't want to look at that. Like completely oblivious mm. to what's going on. And I think we can also see that in some people. Do you ever feel yourself dipping into that? Of like, course. Yeah. So how do you check yourself to remain a functional adult through these situations? Because like I f- can see myself getting pulled into an adaptive child, but I think for the most part, I'm able to recognize it. Maybe not all the time, but some of the times I am. How do you remain a functional adult? Like what would a functional adult look like with what we're dealing with right now? Because it is, it is very traumatic and chaotic and it like the i think what's scaring a lot of people and i'll speak for myself here i guess is the potential of where this could lead if we continue down this path of being pulled into that which is why i feel so called to speak on not supporting genocide of palestinian people because i know the response will continue to escalate and get worse and worse and worse leading us into something that is potentially way worse than the initial acts themselves so how What does a functional adult look like amidst all this shit that we're dealing with? So 
we're able to respond instead of reacting. So when we're in that adaptive child state, we're reacting to everything. And again, we're reacting from those old defense mechanisms that we learn how to survive childhood. When we're in the functional adult, we're responding. So that's the difference between responding and reacting. How can we help ourselves do that is the breath. That's the best tool we have. We can be anywhere. We can have nothing with us. We always have the breath as a tool that's available to us. One of my teachers in Peru used to always say, you can always breathe three times. Yeah. And so what does that do is when you breathe, it creates space right between the stimulus and the response. So it's not an instantaneous reaction. You're creating a space and that space allows other consciousness to come in. It allows you the opportunity to access insight, intuition, creative thinking, critical thinking. And then you can choose a different response rather than reacting the same old automated way to what's going on. So it really always does come back to like the individual level for solutions with any of this stuff. That's how I see it. I don't think there's any saving the world. I think the best service contribution that every one of us can make is to take care of our own stuff, to clean up our own traumas, to take care of our own responsibility over ourselves. Because if more people did that, the world would be a different place. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the people that are in this space have been victimized at some point in time, which makes them want to speak as, as, as a way to sort of quote, save other people from what they had to experience themselves. And how do we reconcile? Like I relate in many ways to your childhood based on what I've heard. Right. And I was victimized. You were victimized, but how do we reconcile the, the reality that we were victimized and not perpetuate a victim mentality? And then how do we recognize that they're like trying to save other people as noble as that may seem is futile. Like it's, it's not actually helpful to try to save other people. I know that was multiple questions in one. So yeah, answer whichever one and then I'll remind right. you. Right. So victimization is a stage that we go through after trauma, after some kind of wrongdoing, something that happened to us. And it is a stage we have to go through. So sometimes people are like, oh, I'm fine. My childhood was great. I don't need therapy. How, I'm that's good. That's I used to be. Remember, I used to be like, oh, I'm the one who doesn't need to talk about any of this stuff. Yeah, I used right. to be exactly like that. Right. So that, that's a refusal of the journey, right? Yeah. And we've all been there at some point. It's a refusal of the journey. And then there's also some people who get stuck in the victim stage and they don't realize it's a stage that we pass through. It's not a life sentence. And so we'll see a lot of that too, right? Where people are celebrating victimhood and they want entitlements or sympathy for victimhood because they can't find their power. The shift out of victimization and into the empowerment of the survivor stage is taking the self-responsibility. It's like making that commitment to owning 100% self-responsibility. And that's where everything starts to change because you realize that your power is in your choice. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard for a person in that victimization stage to recognize they had a choice, to recognize they had a participation in some way, let's say in an abusive relationship. You don't want to see that because when you're in the victimhood stage, you hear the word responsibility and you interpret it as blame. Yes. And you've been blamed for everything by the perpetrator. So you're hypersensitive to this idea of being blamed for something. And it's also true that everything that the perpetrator did was not your fault. Everything Mm -hmm. everybody else does is not your responsibility. But we are each fully responsible for our choices, our actions. And so that's the empowerment is when a person can recognize, okay, I do have a choice. And that's actually where my power is. That's what gives us a sense of empowerment versus all the false empowerment that a person will indulge in in that victimization stage, including vengeance and retribution. And that's that's a very nasty cycle a person can get stuck in that's perpetuating the victimhood. What about what about continuing to talk about it over and over and over again and dressing it up in language that seems like it's helpful, if you get what I mean? Like, do you, how do you differentiate that from um, actually being in an empowered state to address what you went through. Do you, yeah, you get what I'm asking there? Like, I think so. The okay. storytelling. Yes, yes. So the people tell the same stories over and over and over yes, again and yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah, you can always tell by the stories, even the stories we're telling ourselves in our inner dialogue, you can always tell what state you're in based on 
the language of the story that you're using. Yeah. So the story sounds like I'm a victim of some sort, or the story sounds like I'm figuring this thing out. Okay, I'm this empowered survivor now, or I'm really thriving and prospering in life. And so often that storytelling you hear is that victim story over and over and over again. And it can be really exhausting to be the person listening to that. But the other person is not able to find their way out of that yet. So they're, they're stuck in that loop, mm -hmm. that repetition loop. How much of what you experienced when you were younger and just in a meta perspective, do you think that you chose before this life or that you attracted at some level? Because that's the other thing too, where it can seem almost blaming, but I personally, you know, despite going through some really fucked up shit in my childhood, do think at some level I either chose that path, maybe not the specific details, or that to some degree, especially as I started to grow up, I attracted more of those things. How much of that do you think is true and present in any of these dynamics? Personally, I think spiritually, we all came into this life with a mission and a purpose. And I think that we probably knew beforehand that this would be the immersion training for yeah. that purpose. And we come here and we forget and we suffer and we go through all this stuff. But every one of these opportunities, these experiences is an opportunity. It's like your immersion training. You were born, whatever experiences happened to you were part of you becoming who you are to do what you're going to do in the world. And so I think when we can look at it like that, we can recognize, okay, this was all serving good. It wasn't, yeah. it didn't happen because I deserved it and I was a bad person. It happened because this is the work I'm supposed to do. So I needed this training. Yeah. But it depends what we do with that, right? Because the different option would be, I could have used that for self-destruction, which would have been an easy path. It's all our you choice, that. right? Like that's, that comes back to free will. Cause I look at the same thing with COVID for those who recognized that despite how traumatic, chaotic and, and, uh, fear inducing that whole scenario was even for us who saw through the whole narrative it was you know we were talking about before this like were you fearful of government tyranny at any point in time fearful of uncertainty i know i was but it's using that as a catalyst to help initiate positive change in your life and then being able to reflect back on that and say wow to a large degree i am thankful for klaus schwab and bill gates and people like this despite how megalomaniacal and psychopathic they are but they acted as that catalyst for me to alch alchemize this whole situation and, you know, turn it into a net positive. We all know that big ag is poisoning our food supply and big pharma's so-called medicine is straight up poison. What most people aren't aware of though is that most supplements are also filled with artificial sweeteners, dyes, GMOs, glyphosate, and a host of other toxic ingredients. Even many of the more natural supplements. My good buddy James Benefico dedicated his life to crafting the world's cleanest, most nutritious organic supplements after a pre-workout energy drink caused heart palpitations so severe that he almost landed up in the ER. Organic Muscle was born, revolutionizing sports nutrition by using exclusively non-GMO ingredients from USDA Organic Farms. Since then, tens of thousands of people, including myself, have leveled up their fitness and their health with Organic Muscle's award-winning natural pre-workout. There's no jitters, no heart palpitations, no itchy skin, just nourishing organic food and herb-based ingredients for clean, sustained energy, strength, endurance, and recovery. Numerous studies have shown that Tonka Ali is the most effective herb in the world for naturally boosting testosterone levels. And we know that testosterone levels are depleting all over the world because of what's put in the food supply, what we're exposed to, Organic Muscle has the world's first fully organic Tonka Ali supplement. I only support and promote things that I actually use and I can say I legitimately use Organic Muscle products. Use code FORWARD15 at checkout for 15% off at organicmuscle.com. So I, I look at COVID as an initiation. Like it, it, was, it was an initiation, like I said, a catalyst. Um, and I think my intuition spidey senses whatever you want to call them were tingling when it came to this situation with israel palestine and i've already talked about it so many times by the time this releases i don't want to get into too many of the details on it that's that's i don't think helpful at this point especially for the sake of this conversation but in general i do look at it as if it's another initiation very similarly to what covid was have you thought about it in that way too yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, really, isn't it all a calling back to God? 
Yeah. Like every abusive relationship on an interpersonal level or even what's happening in the world, like when you look back at how much your life changed since 2020, you probably got a lot closer to God. Amen. Right. And yeah. so I think this is going to be a whole other level of that. Yeah. And ironically, like I said earlier, it's, it's touching on our identity in a much, much, much deeper way, especially for people who, you know, I'm not going to say that all religions are bad. I, I think, I forget who said this, someone I talked to recently, they're all different icing on the same cake. They're trying to point back to some fundamental truth. Um, but for those who don't have a deep spiritual connection and are more caught up with the identity of the ideology or of the religious group itself, this is going to be really challenging because what we see right now happening is all three of the Abrahamic religions are being challenged. All three of the world major world religions are being challenged in a very deep way. And I think as this continues, if you are, are failing to grasp the reality that that identity is not who you fundamentally are, it's just uh, effectively a monopoly piece on a monopoly board that you can choose to play as you want to relate with other people or to share ideas. And, you know, I'm not saying it's bad to call yourself a Christian, a Muslim, or a Jew, but it's recognizing that your true identity is much, much deeper than that. And I think that's the challenge right now that will continue to be uh, inflamed over the next, I don't know how long, but a long time. I mean, the, the Deagle report, as you pointed out in your article, um, uh, 2025, it said that the population of the earth is supposed to be basically cut in half. Right. Yeah. So I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. I think, you know, when, when it triggers those deep identity things that we're grasping onto really it triggers like a self-preservation instinct or like when a person like let's say identified as a christian if christians are being persecuted then it's going to trigger this thing in me that's like the self-preservation mode because these are my people yeah and so i think that's probably part of a big big part of what's going on now even more so than what happened during covid i definitely agree with you on that and you're right that that's not our true identity right none of this my name my title my anything none of this is really real and that's actually one of the gifts of really traumatic things that happen is when you are stripped naked of all of that who are you really <laughs> i'm laughing because during my like initial childhood trauma healing i, I talked about earlier um in 2018 2019 i had that moment of like i don't know who i don't know who the fuck i am like i have no clue who i am and it's really dark but the backside of that, I was like, wow, I get to be authentically who I want to be now. Like, I don't have to latch on to any of these false identities that I had before. But it was challenging as shit. And I feel like the more something is ingrained in you and you have a community of people around you enabling that pseudo identity, it makes it even more challenging to get out of that. Like, I've been going back and forth with a few of my family members, sending them some things related to Israel, Palestine, and they are devout evangelical Christians that are very, very, very supportive of Israel, irrespective of what Israel does. Also conflating the Israeli government with the people on the land, which people tend to do. And if you, I've sent her some, sent them some verifiably true information and they refuse to look at it because it's too much for them. And they've gotten pissed off at me and said that they don't want to speak to me about it anymore. And I feel like, again, it's just another rendition of exactly what happened over the last three and a half years of experiencing cognitive dissonance where it's just too hard to look at something. And you talk about cognitive dissonance in your article. And I think like the, the meta point of your article is the induction by confusion. So can you can you go into how we as we're having our identities challenged the the confusing nature of the information flow sort of triggers cognitive dissonance in us when we're presented with something that is that goes against what we believe. Yeah, so that confusion induction <clears throat> it's used in hypnosis. Let's say a person has a really strong critical mind it's hard for them to let go because they want to stay in control. And so like the whole counting backwards from 10 to one thing and like the other 
the other inductions don't really work so well. The confusion induction will be the person will talk about all these things that don't make sense, like this big word salad. And when your brain is trying to follow and trying to follow and it can't follow anything and it can't grasp anything, then it just kind of shuts down over that overwhelm, right? And then you're in the induction, basically. Now you're in that state of trance. So I think that's what's going on. That's part of the cognitive dissonance. You say like coming from the media, from government, right? Or even from like pundits who are sharing their perspective on something. It's like too confusing, right? Or like what you're seeing on social media or anything. It's all confusing. There's there's information all over the place Mm -hmm. and it's contradictory and there's mixed messages and things that don't make sense. Like how did this really happen? You know, there's all these questions, right? So all of that confusion is part of it. And when it gets to that point, everybody has their own point of overwhelm. And then it's like your brain just shuts down and then you can be caught in that state where you're easily suggestible, you're in that denial, the whole, the whole uh, cognitive dissonance. I was living in Mexico and I heard this group of expats talking. Somebody was mentioning the documentary Loose Change to someone Uh else about 9-11. And these are all retired people. And I overheard this one guy say, listen, I can't watch that. Because if that's true, I can't exist in a world like that. And I was like, that's cognitive dissonance. Like that was just so clear to me. And I've heard people say that exact sort of thing over the last few years, how hard it is to see new information because your brain literally shuts down. It shuts out all new information when you're in that state. Knowing what you know about family dynamics, do you think a lot of people who behave in that way where they're like, I just can't know that. I don't want to know. Also might have something in their life that they're unwilling to look at about their mom or dad. Usually. Usually that's the case, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because I see a lot of people who parentify media and government and um, Kelly Brogan talks about how even amongst like the freedom community who, who realize how bad government is. And this is the trap that I fall into. Sometimes I fully recognize it is you can be the, uh, the child who is trauma bonded and like wants approval from your father figure or your mother figure, or you can be the rebellious one. And that kind of goes back to the wounded child versus the adaptive child then too. Right. So you're, it's like fawning versus fighting. Yeah, fawning versus fighting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can you can you touch on like how that plays out in family dynamics and how we see that playing out in the world now too? The defensive reactions. Yeah. 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 So you know we all tend to go towards one or two of these defensive reactions because that's how we learn how to survive childhood. So like the the fighters will be argumentative and they want to confront things and whatnot, and then the people who flee walk away from the situation, turn away from the information. Um, don't even look at it. And then the people who are frozen are usually so terrified that they're stuck. And what happens is because we can't stay in that shutdown state for very long. It's like when a mouse gets caught by a cat, its body fiends death is like a last ditch survival mechanism that's only meant to last a short period of time because your respiration shutting down, your heart rate, your digestion, everything. So as humans, we adapt. When we get stuck in that terrified state, we adapt and we dissociate. So we check out. We go to video games, fantasy, you know, social media, whatever it is, mindless scrolling, TikTok, you know, we check out of reality. We're not really here and present. And then fawning is the other one where, you know, something crazy is going on. And so we try to people please, we minimize, we normalize what's happening. We act like everything is okay to try to survive. So we all tend to gravitate towards whichever ones we learned in childhood to survive those circumstances. What do you find happening in you? Like, So I tend to go to the freeze state a lot. And yeah. so I have to be very conscious of like, okay, wake up again. Like you're, you're in that state, come back, be present, come back to your breath, go sit in nature, go talk to God. And fawning used to be one of the things that I would do in my earlier years just to survive. And then I stopped fawning as much. And then I would start using the flight. So I would just leave the situation. Like as soon as I started getting censored on social media, I was like, I'm out. I'm done with this. Is that why like, you stopped making videos on YouTube? <laughs> it felt like voluntarily entering into an abusive relationship. Okay, yeah, and so, so I was wondering that because you had so many good videos in the past and like one of the videos you talked about, it was a 19 minute one. I think it was from a Q and a and like, I don't want to get into my family dynamics, but it resonated with me so much. It talks about 
the difference between psychological abuse and then emotional and physical and, and verbal abuse and how psychological abuse is so much more nefarious. And I think in ways that we've been programmed via media and movies is that like when we watch a movie, the bad guy is very obviously the bad guy in most cases, or if it's like a covert bad guy, it's still pretty obvious. And I think the way that that plays out in reality, I mean, Bill Gates and Klaus Schwab, those are exceptional examples, but it's typically much more psychological in that we are tricked into thinking that something that is fundamentally very bad for us is for our own good. And I think when it comes to this situation that we're experiencing right now, like the repetitive phrase, Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to defend itself. And then what you point out in your article too, is that they even get us to energetically consent to what they're doing by, I forget who it was. I think it was the U.S., the new U.S. uh, uh, Speaker of the House, right? Uh, Mike, what's his name? Mike? Johnson. Johnson. Yeah, I think yeah. I don't pay attention to politics. But, <laughs> but he th- that was one of the first things that he said was getting us to consent to that. And it's like, we think that that's good. We think that it's a good thing. It's like, oh no, this is what needs to be done. Civilians are just going to be killed. And that's a really sad thing. That's a part of war. I think that was a security. It was like the security director of the White House or something who said that part about, oh, you know, right. innocent lives are going to be taken. It's just war. And yeah, I definitely feel like they're manufacturing public consent for that. But another really alarming thing that I think they're manufacturing public consent on is using nuclear weapons. Like they have multiple times dropped it in the media or big, you know, names of people are saying this. It's like they're they're conditioning people to think and believe that this is okay and this is normal. And that's the progression of where this is going. There is this Naval Academy grad who analyzes markets and he looked at the fiscal year 2024 defense budget and he said that for the first time since the invasion of Iraq, it had gone up to around the same levels, which would indicate that the U.S. government intends to or thinks that it will be in war in 2024. So when I saw the October 4th thing, I was like, I don't think it has anything to do with that frequency stuff that everyone's so freaked out about. I think this is conditioning us to accept that this is the reality moving forward with respect to war. What did, what did you think it was? I think it's both. I don't think it's the frequency thing, the way everybody was talking about activating this Marburg thing or whatever's yeah. going on. But I think what it, the, the frequency is everything, right? Everything is frequency and energy. So yeah. what if part of that was like a frequency of maybe just the terror of it, of you get an emergency alert and what happens? Your nervous yeah. system activates and you're in the sense of terror. And something I noticed like a few weeks before the war actually started on October 7th was like this dramatic increase in the spiritual warfare on a micro level. And it was like to stoke fear. And I think this was like a fear harvest and they used that energy to launch the war. And now they're just harvesting more and more fear. Yeah. And you bring up a good point on everything being frequency because that was kind of my point is we know our phones are emitting in our devices and I'm sitting with one on my lap ironically right now, but are emitting harmful frequencies at all times. They don't need to indicate to us that they're going to do that. Obviously they, you know, revealing of the method, they tell us what they're going to do a lot of the times beforehand, but I don't ever think they choose a specific date. But the point you bring up in driving us through fear frequency rather than actual frequencies do our device through our devices is actually, I think much more pervasive and harmful. I mean, talk about how many of us over the course of the last three and a half years were stressed beyond belief or had, you know, just an underlying level of fight or flight at all times. I mean, I went on Luke Story's podcast and I brought up how huge fear played into COVID and even, you know, measurable outcomes. The CDC published studies, second strongest risk factor for death was fear slash anxiety related disorder. And that's the point that I brought up to him is that this underlying level of fear is actually much more harmful. And I think that anything that's going on in the world coming from so-called authorities is just conditioning us to stay in that constant state of fight or flight where it's like our baseline, because that's actually what helps perpetuate the reality that they're trying to create. 
Fear is the currency of control, and fear is the glue of the trauma bond. And you said on the article, most people are done with the COVID fear campaign. So I think the only way they can carry out the next steps of Agenda 2030 would be to utterly terrify people (laughs) with something new and unknown and potentially far more dangerous. Then offer perceived acts of kindness and many people will be right back in the state of captivity, a.k.a. Stockholm Syndrome. So you wrote that before October 7th, right? Before Mm -hmm. the Israel-Palestine thing broke out. So you talk about coming back to the breath, but what, when, when we're, do you think it's important to completely shut off what's going on in the world? Let's put it that way. No, I think it's important to be informed. Okay. I think there, it's a balance, right? Yeah. So it's not all or nothing. Cause I think one tendency could be, well, I'm not going to pay attention to anything cause it's just too overwhelming, but that's not healthy either because even though it may seem like it's not affecting us right now, it's going to affect us and it is already affecting us at some level. So I think it's good to be informed, but to have that balance where obviously the more chaotic and intense things get in the world, the more self-care we need to Mm -hmm. keep up with that. And so keeping that balance in mind is really key. Because that's one of the things that I wrestle with is knowing that they weaponize our own not only fear, but focused awareness towards something against us to help perpetuate that reality. Coming to terms with what is, but not perpetuating more of it. And it's like, what I'm, what I'm trying to tease out here is you could, you could relate it to like a micro level of, of trauma healing where some people will say, you don't even know, need to go back and look at any of that stuff. Just focus your thoughts and your feelings on creating a new reality. And I think the the approach that I take personally that works for me is, no, I do need to acknowledge and uproot some of that stuff. I need to accept the reality at, at, that is, and then align my thoughts and feelings. But what is the balance between perpetuating the reality um, by focusing attention on it and and just accepting the reality and helping to transmute it to create a new one. Right. So this is this is complex to find this yeah. balance. And I think it's probably unique for every person as mm-hmm. well. But I think, you know, where where can you find that balance is are you getting carried away on whatever emotional frequency it is that they're stoking, whether it's fear, outrage, hatred, wrath, like whatever it is, are you getting carried away in an emotion? Then you need to come back to center. Mm-hmm. And so it's always about coming back to center, coming back to center because when you're here in the center, you're resourced. You have access to all the resources that you will need to figure out and navigate your way around whatever is going on. So I think that's always the key is, are you coming back to center or are you leaning in some direction? Are you being pulled in some direction? Another question with that though, is how do you differentiate between being pulled along in an emotion and just like feeling an emotion to its completion? Cause that's I feel like I'm asking like personal questions now. Like how do I recognize the difference for myself? Like how do you know the difference between being pulled into an emotion to where you're perpetuating it and, and just feeling an emotion that needs to be felt to its completion? You you get what I'm asking? Sure. So, so maybe the whole being pulled along is, is there's like a, there's like a motivation towards something. Like there's a movement towards something with that emotion. That emotion is fueling something versus the necessary processing of that emotion here so that you can clear it. So like, let's say fear comes up. I need to face, okay, I'm feeling really afraid right now. Let's lean into that. Let's really feel what that is. And I find that the way to get out of that fear, because I was in this really intense fear in 2020, I ended up even having to eat mushrooms to try to get myself out of that because I had You're no one like around me. like like every day? No, I took a massive dose. <laughs> you, you, okay, I, like, I needed to get through the fear yeah. and I knew there was no other way through. And after hours of torment in this fear, I finally surrendered to it. Like I was fighting, 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 fighting it until I went into my very center core. I curled into like a fetal position and I went all the way into the center and I just kept breathing into it and breathing into it and breathing into it until it finally popped. Mm -hmm. And it was the face of this woman that I love, a friend of mine, like a sister who came up to me and she said something to me. And it was that connection in my mind. This wasn't even real. Like she wasn't Mm -hmm. happening here. But that connection was what suddenly dissipated that fear. And so 
yes, we have to do our own work ourselves, that self-regulation piece of, okay, I'm feeling this emotion. Let me process through this and not dump it on somebody else and not use it to some way that's going to hurt someone else. But also the value of the co-regulation and what we can offer one another. You know, in couples, you have each other to co-regulate. Some of us don't have that. And so maybe we have an animal, another mammal we can co-regulate with or close friends, you know, because that connection is really the antidote to all of this disconnection, the whole divide and conquer thing mm -hmm. that's at the core of the spiritual warfare, that's at the core of what these perpetrators are doing in the world. We, when we connect human to human, we dissipate all of that. And, and that's the whole point of what's going on. I think, I think back to like Occupy Wall Street in 2008, right? People always talk about how it seemed that there is a, a, a bridge amongst the divide at that point in time because everyone was on the same page that no, like what the bankers are doing is really effed up. And then we had the crash, right? Or, or something happened just after to then split up people as they were starting to come together. And I think that's what we, we're seeing right now with the quote, freedom space as it was starting to get really big there's there's a lot of people who i would have considered as part of the freedom movement up until this israel palestine situation which is now another way to divide us amongst each other and it's like we're perpetually falling for these divide and conquer narratives and you can look at that from an overarching perspective kind of looking at large groups of people but what it comes down to is being able to freaking just do what you just described just like sit with your own shit and not try to cope and find ways to avoid feeling. And I think that in many ways, when people get stuck with an emotion, it's because they're not actually just allowing themselves to truly feel it, which is how they get stuck in the emotion. Because, you know, I, Kylie, my wife has a running joke with me, the amount of times that I bring up water fasting, especially because I did it once. <laughs> but but it was so powerful for me because there was no escaping. There was no like turning somewhere else. There was like, I, my energy was being conserved to detoxification and to healing my own shit. And what was so powerful is that there were these things that were lingering inside of me, some that I was constantly aware of, some that I wasn't, that I had to just face and be with and just be with them. And when I would just allow myself to sit there and feel them and not cope by you know, trying to meditate or breathe in a certain way or, or eating food or working out or just mindlessly scrolling, just sit and be with my emotions. It would move through me. And then I felt more whole on the back end of that. And I think that's the thing that so many people are missing right now is just being willing to do the, the very daunting but necessary individual work of just facing your own shit because at the end of the day that's all we can really do to change any situation of course like your article incredible my work i think is somewhat impactful for some people probably <laughs> i don't know but like that is useful to some degree but it's useful in that it's helping to identify things in this reality that are latching that that are latching on to the things within you that you need to deal with Right. For sure. And that is the hard part, right? Is to sit with that emotion, to face it, to process it. It's a lot easier to distract yourself on yeah. anything else, which is our tendency. I think all of us do that. You know, it's not like anybody's immune to that. But it's so important to be able to process that. That's actually how we part of the trauma healing process is the grieving. Like you mm -hmm. have to process that. Like there's been massive grief. There's everybody's had some sense of loss since 2020 some people a lot more than others but part of the healing is to actually feel all the feelings that are coming up around that be willing to sit with it to process through it and then it goes away it stops bothering you yeah. so much because it's like you're releasing that you're clearing the cachet i think what we're experiencing right now is going to escalate quite a bit so what what is your message if you could if you could share one message with someone to help solve this issue we're dealing with that that is a fundamentally a collective issue right because this again has the has the potential to get very bad but then for people who recognize it as a catalyst 
it has the potential to turn into something very good. But I, I do personally think that it's going to get better before it gets worse. It's like a collective dark night of the soul, if, if you will. So what would you say is the message that, you know, my audience, which tends to be amongst the health and freedom movement needs to hear right now. And because we can look at the things that are going on in the world and what is to come and feel very helpless, feel very helpless to do anything to change any of it. So what is what are things that we can actually do and control to help ensure that we are better on the back end of all the stuff that we're facing right now and that we will face? Yeah, I think a, a helpful perspective is to ask, just stop and ask yourself at any moment when things get overwhelming, what can I learn from this right now? How can I transmute this experience that's happening into something positive? for my purpose, for some contribution that I'm going to make to somebody else? How can I transmute this in a positive way? What am I learning right now? Because everything that's happening is teaching us all the time. And so I agree, things are probably going to get a lot worse before they get better. It's the hardest in those moments when things are the toughest to remember that perspective. Because when it's really hard, you're in survival mode, you're reacting to things, always coming back to center, coming back to your breath. What can I learn right here? What can I do with this? And so just allowing yourself to kind of almost come out of that situation, like you're watching a movie for a minute. Now you're not in it. You're not emotionally reactive to everything, but you're kind of watching like a movie when you're watching a movie and and you kind of have this foreshadowing of what's going to happen. You want to tell the character to like, do this or that, or pay attention to this or that. Be that person for that's yourself. The pr- that's the pro- That's what I struggle with personally. <laughs> like I, because I think like you, I see so clearly what's happening. I mean, you even described like the lull period before the buildup, and that's what we've experienced over the last twelve months. And that's where it's so hard for me, and I would imagine much of my audience and much of your audience, not to get pulled into the stuff because you do see and you want to help other people see so clearly what's going on. You know, you know what I mean. It's like. I get pulled in that trap where then I'm engaging with and perpetuating that energy too, instead of remembering like, oh, I do see this and then zooming out and being able to not get just caught up in the muck, you know? Mm -hmm. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. It's so freaking hard. (laughs) Yeah. And because I I agree with you, I do think it's necessary to, to be aware of what's going on and it is useful to, to call out what's going on. So other people can be reminded because that's what we're doing. We're all reminding each other, Mm -hmm. right? Cause I fall back into conditioning. I fall back into really shitty patterns sometimes. And it's helpful that I have my wife who can see things or the community of people I have around me that are able to sort of pull me out of it. Like Dr. Mm -hmm. Edith is a perfect example of that. But yeah, I think being able to zoom out is, is so, so, so important right now. And I think it comes back to another thing that you talk about in your article is, is just presence is realizing that you're being pulled into perpetuating this based on being aware of the possible future scenarios and, and being both aware of that, but still coming back to being present in the moment. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the key is presence. That's the greatest gift you can give yourself. And it's the greatest gift you can give someone else. Because when you're really present, you're the best husband. When you're really present, you're the best father to your kids. Mm -hmm. You're the best person who's doing your work. And we can get so easily triggered and taken off center based on all the things that are happening and all the things that are being thrown at us. And that's all by design, of course. Yeah, it is by design. Mm Mm-hmm. My wife off camera had a question that you just heard her ask that I'm going to repeat. Um, How do you recognize what's going on in the world, right? And, And sort of forecast what's to come and prepare for it in a way that is not pulling you into being so afraid of what's to come. I think when we, when we take some preparations, then we don't have to fear as much. So it's not a bad idea to store some food and water and other Regard, things. Like, re- you know? irrespective of what's <laughs> exactly. going on though, right? Totally. Yeah. Because when you have some of those things prepared, then you don't have to stress about that. That's like one less thing that you have to think about. And for me personally, like the way that I feel the safest about whatever is going to happen is just talking to God. And this is like a new practice that I developed in 2020 where 
I got it from the Jewish practice, Hikvodedut, which just means like you go out in solitude, no devices, nothing. You go out in solitude and you just talk to God like you're talking to a friend in your native language, saying whatever you want to say. And for me, it's about sometimes I'm talking to God and sometimes I'm just in a state of receptivity and I'm saying, tell me something, talk to me. I want to hear you. What do you have to tell me? And I notice how my intuition gets really, really, really strong wow. as I do this. And I get all these messages and like all everything in the world is like all the nature is talking to me. And like the things start wow, telling me these intuitive cool. things. And I'm like, I'm always going to be OK. No matter what happens, I'm going to be all right. I'm going to be safe. And so there is there's no amount of arsenal of guns that you can have that can create that same state that I think you can have when you're connected to creator. Mm. That's your best blessing and your greatest protection. And and it's such an important reminder that we're not this, like this is not who we truly are. And also unironically, that's ultimately what they play on. Aside from playing on our attachments to false identities, Republican, Democrat, left, right, Jew, Christian, Muslim, all the identities that they're playing on right now is that they ultimately at a core level play on the the fear of no longer existing. So when you come back to understanding that we are infinite and eternal, um, then the fear of death doesn't have as much of an effect on you, I think. But it's hard because as soon as the ego senses annihilation, like this merging into oneness, it like comes up and fights against yeah. that because it's terrified of losing its identity. Yeah. Another thing I wrestle with, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too. How do we, how do we recognize like everything is perfect? Cause it really is, especially as you immerse yourself in nature and shut off the world, it, and, and you, you feel that connection to the creator that everything is just as it should be right now, but not allow that to render us um, apathetic and and not willing to engage to create a better world. Because there's a balance there, right? right? You know what I mean? Yeah. You, I think you get what I'm asking, right? Totally. Okay. Like you don't want to be passive. So how, how do you do that? It's a tough balance. And yeah. it's like, it's a moment to moment adjustment, I think, of constantly checking in with myself. You know, am I in that state where I'm fighting against it? Because that's the other at the other end of that scale, the passivity of like, there's nothing I can do about it. And the other end is I want to control it. I'm going to fight against it. I, I need to control something to feel safe. And neither one of those is really going to bring us anywhere beneficial. Yeah. So always coming back to center. Yeah. Wow. I feel like a lot of this episode, I was just asking things for reflection points for me. I'm like, how can I do better with this? Because these are the questions that I wrestle with, though, honestly. Like, because I, you know, as someone with a quote platform, I feel like it's it's my duty to reflect on these things so that I can better serve the people who tune in to what I'm saying. And I think it's it's important to, but yeah, these are things that I genuinely wrestle with because like the way that I look at this similarly to you on the, on the balance thing is that I recognize at a deep level that everything is as it should be. And I don't think we're ever going to get to a utopian point where we defeat darkness. I don't think anytime in the near future, we're going to get to a point where there is no government and we're all operating in a voluntary society, but that's not going to stop me from sharing that message that I deemed to be true and doing the work that I think needs to be done in this reality to act as that necessary, I don't want to say antagonist, but protagonist to the antagonist in this big dance that we're in constantly playing off against the darkness and the light, darkness and the light to help expand all that is, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In your little circle, you can create those things that you dream of yeah, and want to create. Yeah. And, and all that chaos can be happening around you and you have no control over any of that. And we're not going to live in that utopian world, but you can create that little bit of space in y'all's life, in your family life, in your community. Yeah, so true. Yeah. Could you just share about the work that you do, what you offer and inner integration? Yeah. Innerintegration.com is my website. That's where I help people heal from abusive relationships and other toxic relationships and Lately, a lot of people have been talking about the things that are going on in the world because they're recognizing how that's triggering up to the surface unresolved traumas that they have. And I love helping people who 
have this strong sense of wanting to be that person who leads in their family or in their community or in the world in some kind of way. And they're transmuting these experiences into healing for themselves and some contribution that they're giving to others. Beautiful. And your Substack too, right? I do. I write on Substack yeah. sometimes, and every now and then I'll post like clips from my and no, interviews. No more on YouTube, though, right? I I left all those okay. Okay. sites. Yeah, because you have a you have a substantial following on there, and you had a lot of amazing videos. Is it just because they started to censor you a little bit? Yeah, I mean more than that too. Like even in 2019, before all this started, uh, when you hit like 200,000 subscribers, they send you to this coaching program, and it's free. And I'm like free, and they're like yeah, and I'm thinking, well, what's the catch? So I went along anyways to see, and what it is, is like this indoctrination. And they tell oh, you that like the YouTube, the YouTube ecosystem is formed of three entities, the creator, which is you making the content, the viewer, which is the person watching it and the advertiser, which is the person paying, you know, uh -huh. for the clicks. Therefore, if your videos aren't getting seen and, and, and it's not catching on the problem is either the viewer doesn't like what you're creating or the advertiser doesn't like what you're creating. Therefore it's your fault. And I'm like, isn't that wow. interesting that there's two entities missing from this ecosystem, which happen to be the only two under the control of YouTube, which is the AI, the algorithm that they write, which determines everything that you're seeing on there, and the engineers who program. And both of those are at YouTube. Isn't that funny? That is interesting. And it like blew my mind. And I was like, this is the worst gaslighting because right before they invite you to that training, they start crushing your views. Like if you had 80% suggested videos, 80% of your traffic is coming from what they suggest. All of a sudden from one day to the next, it's down to 30. Did you and then see that like, happen? Oh, I watched content? it. No you can, way, they show you crazy. the, they show you the analytics you can see. Wow. And now I'm at 30, right? And this is like beginning, this is like beginning of 2019. And then, oh, hey, we have the solution for you. And then it's this indoctrination of like, it's your fault. So it's like another micro example of just exactly what happened over the last. A hundred percent. And in they're controlling the perception of reality by controlling the information. And I just got to the point where I didn't even want anything to do with that. Oh, my goodness. OK, so you still put out video content, though, right? No, I only Not upload really. like some clips from interviews when they're mm. public on Rumble. But I don't put anything. And else you're fluent up. in Spanish. Yeah. Okay. And Italian, cool. Portuguese, and French. I'm fluent in one language, okay. kind of <laughs> semi fluent in English. So yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, yeah, that's incredible. Well, thank you, Meredith, for for joining me. This was thank you so much awesome. for inviting um, me. Yeah, this was this was great, and your work is so important. So thank you. So is yours. Thank you. 